when you have that passion, money follows. When you make an impact, we'll also make an income. And so I knew that I could have a greater impact working for myself. Hey there, I'm Goli Kalkaran, and this is Lessons from a Quitter, where we believe that it's never too late to start over. No matter how much time or money you've spent getting to where you are, if ultimately you are not happy, then it's time to get out. If you're feeling stuck and you feel like there's got to be more, there's got to be a way to feel fulfilled and excited about what you do, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I will sit down with an inspiring guest who quit their professional career in order to forge their own path and create a life that they love. Hello, beautiful people. Welcome back. Thank you for joining me. I'm excited to jump into another episode, but before we do, I've been asking you guys for questions, and I've received a lot of wonderful ones um, through my Facebook group and uh, on Instagram and through email, and so I want to start addressing some of those questions. I'll be addressing them in the future, maybe with some guests, and we'll see how it goes. So if you do have a question, just shoot me an email at goalie at Lessons from a Quitter, or find me on social media and DM me, um, and we'll hopefully get it on a show soon. But this one comes from our Facebook group. Lori in the group posted, I'm considering starting work on another degree in order to shift someday from working as a clinical occupational therapist, which she's done for 15 years with her current master's degree, to potentially teaching and or writing. There are doctorate degrees available that I can do online mostly in less than two years that would, in theory, open up those opportunities, but would first require a further investment of time, energy, and money the potential new opportunities would then not pay as well as what I currently do. As a mom of young kids and someone still paying off debt from my original education, that prospect is a bit scary. Also, I've considered working on a journalism degree since what I mostly want is to write, but want more skills in order to open up those opportunities. Same risks involved, potentially similar outcomes. Okay, this issue has come up already a lot, which is interesting because we're only 35 episodes in. We're a relatively new podcast. And the fact that it's come up in so many interviews I've done means that it's clearly an issue. And I know it's an issue because I had the same thoughts when I was quitting. And I think that most people in a traditional path, once they feel stuck, feel like the logical next step is to just get another degree. And what that is, is it's helping us like get over this imposter syndrome that we have, that we feel like I can't just start doing something. I need someone else to give me this stamp of approval that or like teach me these skills. And so I have to go back and get that degree. Now, obviously there's certain degrees where like, you know, in order to work in that field, you have to have that degree. But from what I see in your question, I mean, when you're talking about the doctoral degree, I mean, even further down, you're basically saying that you would rather write what you would what you want to do is the journalism one, but I think the doctoral one seems safer since you've been doing it for 15 years. So those are two separate issues. I think first focus on what it is you truly want to do and let's focus on that. But even dealing with the doctoral one, I would say instead of like sitting in kind of like, I don't know, you know, limbo area, start reaching out, reach out to people that have doctoral degrees in your, in occupational therapy or the teachers that are doing the kind of teaching jobs that you want. People are willing to help. I cannot stress this enough. You don't know how many people I've just cold emailed or on LinkedIn, and they are more than happy to talk to you, to have a coffee if you're in the area, to just jump on a phone with you. And if you genuinely just want to know about their job, they will be willing to talk to you and figure out like, what are the prospects? Because a lot of doctor, like doctoral candidates that I've talked to, have a really hard time finding teaching jobs because the industry has just changed. There's no more like tenured positions. So start looking at that end game before you go back and you spend money and realize like, is that something you want to be doing? With the journalism one, which I, I mean, it seems from your question that like, that's what you would rather do. If you'd rather write, then I wouldn't even think about the doctoral thing. Like get really quiet and think about what it is that you want to be doing. And what I would say in episode... 32 with Ellie Mistel, we talked about this. And it's always interesting to me that we are willing to pay for an education. We're willing to pay and put in the time to get this degree that a lot of times in this day and age doesn't really mean much and won't open up as many doors as you think it will. But we're not willing to like work for free. And what he did is he went to a local news organization and just offered to work for free. And if that's something that you could do instead of spending the time doing, you know, the journalism degree, 
why don't you reach out to some people and see if you can start writing for them for free or, or, you know, just helping them in any way that you can and maybe learning the ropes that way. Because that does a couple of things. One, you're actually gaining real skills. So a lot of times with schools, we think we're going to get this degree and it's going to give us skills. But as many of us know, with a lot of our degrees, like until you get into the job, you didn't really learn how to do anything. Um, And two, it doesn't lock you into like a two-year program that you're spending all this money in and you may not like at the end. You know, you may go work for someone for six months and realize, "Mm, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be this kind of journalist. Or you may, you know, realize that there's another part of writing that you actually love more and that's what you want to be focusing on. That's why I stress like taking action so much because I think we get so overwhelmed in this feeling of stuckness and we just sit with it so much that we, we look at whatever avenue we think can get us out without actually like putting ourselves out there. And so again, I think going back to school seems is like a safe, quote unquote, safe way. And a lot of times it doesn't actually lead to what you thought it would. We had on episode eight with Maria Granovsky, she had a PhD and then she went and got her law degree and then she quit to do marketing because that's what she had wanted to do from the beginning. On episode 30 with Joanne Bargalt, she was an accountant and then she went and became a dentist. And then she, again, quit. I mean, is like in the process of starting her side business because that's what she wanted to do is marketing. So I would just say, really get quiet about what it is you actually want and figure out what you can do to actually start doing that. You know, on episode 28, Paula Pant talked a lot about how much space there is online for writing. Like there are tons of blogs and you know, news outlets and uh, publications that need content. And what is mostly stopping us is that fear of like, I don't know what I'm doing. Who am I to start writing? I can't just submit this. And that's nonsense. I mean, you've worked for 15 years as an occupational therapist, so you clearly have experience in something that you could write about. And if you want to write about something else, you're a mom, you're, you know, there's millions of things. Stop limiting yourself by that. Stop thinking that you need a degree. I would say, like the two action items I would give to you is reach out to the people that you want to be like, reach out to journalists that you like what they're talking on, reach out to doctoral degrees that are teaching and start finding out what their jobs are actually like and, you know, how you can get into those industries. And the second thing is just start taking action. If you like writing, start writing, figure out how to start writing. There are millions of ways, but you have to put yourself out there. And I mean, in my personal opinion, I don't think you need another degree. I think it's um, more of like a safety net for you. And I think you can do a lot of things. It's scary. It's harder because there's no set path. But the one thing I would hate is that you put in two years, all this money, you get another degree, and that doesn't open the doors you wanted it to, or you get to some place and you still don't like that. So that is my advice for you, Lori. I hope that helps. If you have a question, shoot it my way. Otherwise, let's jump into the episode today with Jen Burson. Jen is incredible. She started out her career as a civil litigator at a prestigious law firm, and we will talk to her about what kind of made her start seeing these shifts that she wanted to get out of law. But piggybacking on the question that I just answered for Lori, I think Jen provides a perfect example of how to go about starting something when you don't really have experience in it. She started just reaching out to products that she liked and offered to help market them for free while she was a lawyer. And that led her on this road to quitting law and establishing her PR agency. She is now the president and founder of Generation PR, which is a public relations and social media marketing firm. And her clients now range from small and mid-sized brands to multi-billion dollar publicly traded companies. She's been featured everywhere, in New York Times, Forbes, Inc., Business Insider, And she was named by Babbel.com as one of the top 10 mompreneurs who made it big. I mean, she's grown this incredible business. And then she's now adding on a second arm to that where she's creating this agency accelerator where she teaches entrepreneurs how to launch, grow, and scale a profitable PR and marketing agency. And we'll talk to her about how within six months, like without having created the actual product, she launched this online portion of her business and she's already made six figures. I mean, she is really incredible and she has so much great insight. So without further ado, let's jump in and talk to Jen. Hi, Jen. Thank you so much for joining me today. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to have you. And I love your story. I'm so excited to get into kind of all of the various parts. But let's start back at the beginning. And why don't you tell us what led you to law school and kind of that earlier part of your legal career, what that looked like? Yeah, God, it feels like ages ago. I've always loved school. And I was getting my undergraduate degree at UC Santa Barbara. And it really kind of started as a way to stay up at the beach during the summers, <laughs> you know, really kind of convincing my parents that I needed to stay in Santa Barbara and not come back down to LA for the summer because I was studying for the LSAT. <laughs> Just felt like, okay, well, if I tell them I'm going to go to graduate school, then they'll allow me to kind of hang out at the beach and be with all the boys and, <laughs> you know, all the fun stuff. And then, you know, I kind of got swept up in the timing. I mean, I started law school in 98. That's when I graduated college. And, you know, I took the LSAT and I ended up getting accepted to USC. And, you know, it was like just a great opportunity to further my education. And I felt like, you know, everyone always says having a law degree is a great background. So I figured, you know, why the heck not? Let me just go and I'll, you know, get an advanced degree in kind of three more years of school. And, you know, it's a huge financial investment. And I'm extremely fortunate. I never take this gift for granted. But my parents always said to me, no matter what, they would support me with my education. As long as I was committed to doing the best that I could, they would support my education. So I, you know, I went to law school, and then I got kind of swept up in the on campus interviewing process, you know, basically my second year, arranging a job for my second summer you know, that process is really competitive. I know you probably remember that. And you, you know, you get swept up in it. And it's like, where are you interviewing? Where did you get an offer? And then by the time we got hired for the summer, it was during the time of, you know, 2000 with the dot com boom, and all of the big dot com companies were hiring away the best lawyers. And so the law firms had to compete. So, you know, the salaries spiked before we ever even worked a day. And, you know, here they are offering us $2,400 a week and whining and dining us. And I mean, I knew better, but I also just kind of went through it. And I really liked the firm where I ended up and I wanted to be in entertainment. And they, it was a very prominent entertainment firm here in LA. And so I accepted the full time offer. And then I bought a house on my own, you know, not married. And I was like, okay, well, now I guess I have to be a lawyer. Um, it was like right after I passed the bar. So I let's say I passed in November, I bought a house in Santa Monica in December. And you know, now I'm a lawyer, right. and I have a mortgage. And this is what I do now. So yeah. That's a lot of people's situation where, you know, they call it the golden handcuffs. And so many of us, it's like you come out and whether you have the financial debt from school or not, it's like a lot of times when you're young and you're making a lot of money and the traditional things to do are to like buy a house and you buy a nicer car and you do all this stuff. And then you're sort of straddled with that job because you have to pay for this lifestyle that you've now created. So I think a lot of people will probably relate to that. When did you start kind of having this inkling that you know, maybe the entertainment law or law wasn't for you that you wanted to kind of get out of that? Well, I ended up really only practicing litigation because, you know, the entertainment side of it, they usually had more senior people and they usually had men, to be really honest with you. And, you know, I started dating my husband. So he was my boyfriend at the time. And I started thinking about my long term plans for the kind of life that I wanted to have. And for me, being in that role in my law firm job, it always felt just like that, just like a job. It never felt like a career. And I always envisioned a career feeling like a bigger part of my life and my identity and something that I really enjoyed. And I always felt like I was showing up every day to a job, working extremely hard. You know, the money at that point, it did not even matter to me at all. I, you know, here's this great house that I loved. I never was home. I would basically, you know, go home for a nap and kind of hose off and return back to the office. And, you know, you're 27 and have basically everything you could ever possibly want on paper, but the life, and I know so many of your listeners can kind of, this would resonate with them, but it just wasn't the life that I wanted. And I also took a step back and kind of looked around and tried to align myself with a mentor that I could follow in their footsteps. And there really wasn't anyone that 
was a mom, was a present mom. I saw kind of a two different paths that women in the law firm took. Either they were partners and they did not have children or they had children and they were never home to see them. And that's a choice, you know, but that's not the choice that I was willing to make. Or they left to, you know, have kids. And when they came back, they weren't, in my view, taken as seriously. Their workload was lightened. And eventually, they were almost systematically phased out. And, you know, this is quite a long time ago. Things probably have changed. I would hope they've changed. But back based on my experience, that's what I saw. And the writing was on the wall for me. I just said, you know, I do not want to go down this path where in seven, eight, nine years, I'm a partner. And what for, you know, for money or prestige? No, I want balance in my life. And my parents were always there for me. I mean, they're entrepreneurs. My dad is a car broker. He's this kind of self-made car broker and, you know, really is focused on his physical health and he golfs and he runs. And, you know, my mom always, you know, had her own thing. She has a master's degree in education, but she ended up selling real estate and kind of worked when she wanted to. And I always had a memory of my parents being home and being available for us when I was a kid. And that's exactly what I wanted for my own family when I ultimately had kids. I just kind of looked around and was like, this is not really like, what did I get myself into? And I just started promoting a brand on the side unpaid. I don't even know how or why I was just so pulled to this fragrance company that actually I discovered in the UK on my bar trip. And when I ran out, it was like this little roller ball that you put on your, you know, your kind of pulse roller. And it smelled so amazing. And the packaging was beautiful. And when I ran out, my mom even said, you know, what if you can track that perfume down, I'd love some for Mother's Day. So I looked everywhere. And this was, you know, back in early Google search days, but it took me a long time to find this company. They ended up being based in Santa Rosa, California. Ironically, like this California company had no US presence. And it was such a great marketing concept and price point was great and the whole brand altogether just merchandise really well. And I don't know what compelled me to, but I reached out to the owner of the company and I said, you know, I really have all these ideas for how to promote your brand. And I had placed a big order and she kind of personally thanked me for it. So I said, if you send me a big box of products, I will, you know, work on getting you in magazines and get the products to celebrities. I didn't even know what this service was. I was just like, I have all these ideas. And I thought she's going to think I'm a crazy person trying to scam her. But she took a chance on me. And I said, I'll do this for free. And, you know, what's the risk? And she ended up sending me a box of all of these lotions and soaps and perfumes. And she sent it to my law firm. And I remember that day so clearly. I got this huge box. I had been in court that morning. And I got back um, right around lunchtime. And I slammed the door to my office. And I ripped this box open. And I was pulling out all these products like, oh, my God, this is the best day ever. I love all this stuff. And, you know, it was kind of like the start of something that I never could have possibly realized how much of an impact that would have on my life. I mean, I just realized, you know, here I was so happy to be doing this work on the side. And then I thought, you know, if I could be doing this every day, this would be the most happy career for me. I would feel like is the best fit for my personality. So then I started researching what is this? Like, what even is this? Because I thought a PR person or a publicist was really there for spin control when a celebrity like acted badly. And you had to, I didn't realize brands were paying for the service. And then I started to ask around and figure out what resources are available. And, you know, it was kind of reverse engineering the process of how do you work with brands to get them exposure and all of that. And, you know, once I realized that this was a viable career, I just took the leap and I always figured I could go back if I ever needed to, but I never looked back. Oh my God. There's so much to unpack here. I love this so much. Going back to what you said, I think it's such an important point and it's something that I really want to highlight and I want to talk about more on the podcast because women and men, I'm not trying to say like now a lot of fathers to deal with so much with balancing of a career and motherhood or fatherhood and being home with children and what you were saying, you know, like looking at that even before you have kids and realizing this kind of career may not be conducive with the kind of lifestyle that I want to have. It's so important because there's a level of 
guilt. I, I'm wondering if you felt that where, especially as a woman, like, you know, you're kind of taught to be this independent, strong, working, you know, woman that leans in and is, you know, and a lot of times I feel like a lot of women feel guilty about saying like, I want to leave this because I want to be more at home because like that's traditional or old school or whatever. Did you feel that when one of the reasons you don't want to do laws because you want to have more time at home? Or was it more like that was just so clear to you about what you wanted that you didn't really care? You know, back then I didn't have children yet. I always knew that I wanted to be a mom. And we weren't married yet. So for me, I felt probably more guilt about disappointing my parents because they really invested in me and they did not take it well. Well, my mom didn't say a lot. My dad was really, really angry. And I think that he was really concerned more than anything. It was a fear of what this meant for me because he didn't really understand what I was getting into when you know, being a lawyer and knowing that the salary and the job opportunities for the most part, and back then they were really great. He, I think, was afraid. So I think more than anything, I was concerned about disappointing my family. But now I feel the pull, like the ebb and flow of the feelings of balancing the business with motherhood because, you know, I'm starting another side of my business, right, that I'm looking to grow. And sometimes I travel to mastermind retreats and marketing retreats in order to learn how to implement the best marketing strategies in my business. And I love it so much. And now I do feel like I have found the career that is a part of who I am and an extension of who I am. But I do feel sometimes that guilt more it's the opposite. Instead of feeling guilty that I want to lean into motherhood, I really want to be the most present parent that I can be. But I feel guilty that I'm also very, very interested in work. And I work from home, but I'm, you know, spending a lot of time working. And I mean, even, you know, to be really candid, one Mother's Day, the kids, they have these like fill in charts. And it's like my mommy's favorite food and my mommy's favorite thing to do. And my son said, first of all, he designed my my favorite item out of clay. He made a computer. (laughs) He said, my mommy's favorite activity is work. And he even said something my mommy is not good at is playing with me. And I mean, that was like devastating for me is my older son and he's on the spectrum. And um, that was really, really hard. But I know that I'm doing the best that I can. And I do spend a lot of time, you know, getting on the ground and playing with my children and making it a focused effort. And I know that between me and my husband, we're both entrepreneurs with our own businesses. And I feel like our children are going to see us being, you know, not working hard, but working smart and being dedicated to our dreams and showing them that anything they want to do is possible. So I try not to make myself feel too guilty about it. You know, but yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I know that that is a hard thing. And we tend to not share those things because we are embarrassed or we don't, you know, we feel so guilty about it. But that's actually one of the points. I think for me, ever since I've gone on this journey, the level of guilt that, again, I think more so women than men have or are instilled with, where it's always like whether it's you're not putting enough at work or you're not putting enough at home and it's never good enough. And it's kind of breaking that cycle of like making ourselves feel guilty about everything because... At the end of the day, like if you're a better individual, if you're a happier individual, you will be a better mother, you know? So if you're doing something that you love, that fulfills you, even if you're not playing all day, every day, there's a lot of people that do that that are not happy. And so it's a matter of like wherever this pendulum is, whether it's more of like, focused on women working or not working or whatnot. It's more of like each person should really have the freedom within themselves, within their own thoughts to kind of follow what they love and figure out like how to be the best version of themselves for, you know, work and life and stuff. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And I don't think you should feel guilty. No, and I don't. And it's kind of funny because I've talked a lot about balance. And like you said, the pendulum, I've even used that exact expression. And you cannot achieve perfect balance in your life. That's an illusion. And I think that if you're committed to kind of focusing on what you're working on at the time, whether it's, you know, doing something for work, or then when your children come home, taking your phone, putting it away, focusing on homework, reading to them, playing, whatever, And I'm not 100% perfect at it, but it is a balance and the pendulum swings between the two. But I also 
always say, and I've written a couple articles about this and shared my thoughts on other, you know, podcasts and things that guilt is so unproductive. It's just a complete like low vibe, low energy emotion, and it doesn't serve us in any way. And, you know, it's easy to kind of go there, but if you can kind of reframe it and, you know, think instead of like, I feel guilty about this, it's, you know, I kind of say, well, I'm so lucky that I have all of these things that I'm so interested in and that fill me up and that I'm lucky that I get to be focused on multiple things. I'm not just a mom. I also have this business and and I don't allow myself to feel guilty. I try to reframe it as like gratitude. And I mean, it sounds a little woo woo, but <laughs> no, but that. That's a great perspective to have. And I think that people that tend to be like type A personalities shun away from the woo-woo, but some of that is very needed, you know? And like you said, getting out of that pity party and kind of figuring out like how to reframe that is a wonderful tactic. So I commend you on that. But I just think that a big thing, like you were just talking about your parents and I was going to ask, like, how long were you practicing when you decided you were going to leave? It was about four years. So that time when you make that decision and you're ready to shift and like, this is what I think the biggest struggle for most people is, is at that moment to make that decision is the hardest decision because... So many people question like, well, maybe if I find another legal job, maybe I can try something else or maybe I could do this part time or maybe I could open my own firm. How did you make that decision that like, no, I'm going to completely put away this education and the time, the effort I've taken to get to here and deal with people's reactions that typically are not very supportive? I think most people have this where it's like a lot of people are, are out of fear, out of their wanting their well-being is like, are, are you know, are you crazy for leaving this quote unquote successful career? Yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, there's a lot here for me because it was a big decision, but I realized I was just betting on myself. That was the biggest, you know, it was a gamble on whether I felt that I could make it happen. I wasn't going out to look for another job or find another company or relying on anybody else. It was relying on myself. And I knew that I was willing to put in the work. And I had such a pull and a passion for this other thing that it just felt like a natural fit for me. And in my mind, you know, I realized I could always go back to law and I gave myself a six month runway. You know, I saved the money. I luckily had that scenario where I had six months to give myself enough time to convert and make it happen. And I really said, I'm not going to panic and jump back in if it's not happening right away. I'm really fortunate that when I started, I was profitable right out of the gate. I, you know, I've always run lean and mean and, and I don't have a lot of expenses. And in the beginning, it was just me. And so even though it was just me, I positioned it as an agency, not as a freelancer. And that always was a great benefit in my business. But, you know, and what you said about disappointing people, literally, this was like an epiphany I had and it hit me on the head like a ton of bricks. I realized, I think I was 27 at the time that this is my life. It's my one shot at it, you know, and I am not here to make other people happy. I'm here to be the best version of myself and the people that love me are going to appreciate that I'm my happiest and I'm serving my life's purpose in a better way than what I was doing before. And it just felt like I am not here to worry or care about what my decisions mean to other people or how they impact other people. It's my life. And you know, it was a big risk. One of the bits of advice I, I've been saying this lately, I think my dad would be like, that's not what I meant. But <laughs> my dad said to me my whole life, because you know, he's always been in business for himself. He said, you'll never be successful working for someone else. And I think for him, the success meant money. And you can, you know, you'll never be rich or successful. Yeah, I mean, you can certainly make a lot of money, but you're not in control of your time. For me, the number one factor in what determines my success is having control, control of how I spend my time, control of who I work with, control of pursuing the things that excite me and interest me, that light me up. And when you have that passion, money follows. When you make an impact, we'll also make an income. And so I knew that I could have a greater impact working for myself. And so that is my definition of success. And I can't sit around and waste my time worrying what others think of my decisions. It's not their life. It's
it's mine. So I kind of had that. I don't know. It was like my whole life up until that point of turning, you know, kind of 27 and pivoting to say like, I'm an adult now and this is my one path, my one shot. It just changed everything for me. That's an incredible perspective to have. I think everybody realizes that is kind of the goal to get to, but it's so much harder to do. You know, I think so many of us are burdened by what people close to us think. And you're absolutely right. I mean, rationally, that's what it is. Like you got one shot at this. You know, I think the number one regret whenever they do all these studies of people on their deathbeds or in nursing homes, it's always like, I wish I didn't live a life for other people. I lived my own life. And that's exactly what you're saying is like you have this one shot. But I know it's so much easier said than done. So I mean, kudos to you for having that strength at 27 to kind of stand up to that and say, like, I'm going to give this a shot. But like, how did you even know how to start an agency? Like you had studied law. It's not like you'd done marketing. Um, How did you know how to charge people, how to find clients? Like, where did all that come from? Yeah, it's it's hard. And you are a bit working, you know, operating in a vacuum when you start. And that's actually I know we're going to talk more about the other side of my business that I have, but I've created an agency accelerator to help people with those same challenges when they're just starting out of really not understanding the business side of performing that service. But I did partner with somebody right out of the gate. It, it, she almost served more as a mentor to me. She was a family member by marriage and had an agency and was represented a few clients and then wanted to go out on her own and start an agency. And I was already doing this on the side unpaid, just really following my instinct and passion. If there was a brand that I loved, I reached out to them and I made a personal connection and said, can I talk to you about more about how I can support you? And at the time, I was really scrappy and willing willing to come in under market and ask people to take a chance on me and give me a limited window, you know, just to really prove myself and then we could reassess. And I used that tactic to get my very first client that I ended up working with for 11 years. And it established my expertise as a, you know, an expert in the baby and kids space. We specialize in baby and kids brands. And now I have publicly traded billion dollar clients in that segment and, you know, in other segments too, but it really all kind of snowballed. But I partnered with somebody who, you know, is probably about seven, eight months. And really, I was good at the sales and bringing business in. And then I got to see a bit about how the company works and, you know, what goes into a press strategy, what goes into a solid pitch, how do you build a media list, just the mechanics of it. But what I'm really good at is sales and, you know, building a solid client pipeline. And even now in my business, I don't do any of the execution. I don't do any of the pitching at all. I have a whole team that does it. I'm just kind of growing the business through building the pipeline and selling our services to clients and putting together proposals and, you know, basically bringing in new business. And then coming up with the strategies and somebody else executes. So that's what I want to teach people how to do is build an agency they can scale. But that's a great question. Because when I started, there was nothing, nothing like that. And you just kind of operate in the dark and you just try to figure it out as you go. But I think what you just literally said in the first part, it was like a masterclass of like how to start any business, I think, especially if you don't have expertise in it. And it can be applied to so many things other than the agency side of like marketing. And I think I've heard this with so many interviews. I mean, what you just said is like, you took the initiative initiative to reach out to people that you liked and offer to work with for them. You offered to work under market so that you could prove yourself. That's what the hustle is, right? No matter what you're doing, as long as you're willing to like take action and take that initiative and then try to like over deliver. That's how, you know, I feel like so many businesses start and I think it's the perfect way of doing it. And I think so many people get caught up in well, like I don't have this background or I never did marketing or I don't know what I'm doing. And I think really it's the mindset. It's like, that's the hardest part is getting past those doubts and saying like, Hey, I'm going to give this a shot. And so like the fact that you could do that and have, you know, everything else is kind of figure outable, right? Like how to charge clients or whatever, but it's just having that gumption to say like, I'm going to try this. Yeah. I mean, why not? You know, it seemed crazy. I mean, looking back on it, I, and I have gotten quite a bit of like media traction with that story, of, you know, Business Insider and Entrepreneur Magazine, like talking about from law to PR, you know, like definitely a 180. And, and it's kind of like, what? what did, why did you do that? But at the time, I just was very drawn to it. And also my husband was getting his MBA at USC and he took a marketing class. And he was taking this class and came home and was like, you know, Jen, 
this stuff is so foreign to me. I cannot wrap my head around it. It makes no sense to me. It's not anything that like lights me up, but I know for you, this is something that comes to you second nature. I was kind of looking at things and helping people kind of merchandise things and helping them come up with brand identity just on the side because I I liked it. And he just said, you know, there's this professor of entrepreneurship here at USC and he's willing to kind of chat with you about your business. And just I got some advice early on that really helped me in that very early stage to kind of have quantum growth in my business. And he basically told me to kind of consider finders, minders and grinders in the business and that I was working in the business on the day to day doing all the execution and essentially serving as the grinder in my own business. And that's a recipe for burnout. And it's a low return activity to be doing the $15 an hour tasks when you should bring in somebody to support you and you can elevate yourself to more of the finder status and be working on the business. And it was scary to bring somebody in. But at the time, I was like, okay, this is probably the next step. And he also said to me, less gen equals more money. (laughs) So in my mentor, James Wedmore, and I know you heard me on his podcast, he says, the less you do, the more you make. And it's really about acting in a strategic manner and really focusing on income generating activities and where you're in your zone of genius. And I implemented that tactic really early on and was able to really have quantum growth in my business at that phase. And yeah, I just kind of I know realize I got off on a tangent with your question, but really the the mindset had so much to do with it. I just feel like, you know, when you're kind of just betting on yourself and you realize you're willing to do whatever it takes, not having a formal training in something, it's not an insurmountable hurdle. It just becomes another part of the challenge of, you know, how am I going to do this one piece today? And you just chip away at it. You know, what is it going to take? How am I going to learn this? And, you know, you learn by trial and error and you just figure it out. Like you said, everything is figure outable. Right. right. No, absolutely. I love that. And clearly that's the way to run a business is to make sure that you're not the one grinding all, all the time. And you see that a lot with solopreneurs. It's amazing that you kind of had that foresight in the beginning. So you've now been doing this for 14 years and you have a whole team, you were saying. And so what does that aspect of your business look like now? Like you guys are still just taking on brands uh, as a PR agency, right? Yeah, we're taking on clients on the PR and social media side. So we have full, you know, PR social media capabilities, done for you services. My clients are are larger companies now. I have three billion dollar brands. I have two publicly traded companies. I have, you know, several hundred plus million dollar brands, which is That's really incredible. nice because Yeah. And, you know, that was the second phase of quantum growth in my business was kind of realizing that my client support had followed a certain path. And I was now able to kind of develop a deep expertise in some spaces. And instead of going broad and offering all things to all people, we went really deep. And, you know, after I stopped working with my longest running client, where we were kind of locked in at a lower rate, it's like when you start at half of market rate, and you can really only increase twice for a $1,000 over 11 years, your rate is really low. And then literally overnight, and I'm not exaggerating, it literally happened overnight when I stopped working with that brand. And I kind of attracted into my world, my ideal client, they came to me and I took a step back and said, where are we in the market with our contacts and the level of results we get? And I adjusted our prices literally overnight. And we're still working with that brand. And once you start charging premium prices, you really attract premium clients. So our you know, our agency clients, I'm just so incredibly lucky. I, I have really, really great brands that we work with. And what ends up happening there is we have great products and great brands that the media and influencers are interested in. And so it's like this really wonderful cycle where we work with great companies and get them great results because everybody wants to talk about them and everybody wants to feature their products. And in turn, we use those results to get more clients. So it's actually right. like a really great place to be in. But I get a lot of new business inquiries through the website. And most of our clients come from really positive word of mouth. And we take our reputation really seriously and always just want to put out the best work and have the best interactions with every potential client and actual client we have. So they go out into the world and share positive feelings about working with us. And that's where our clients come from. That's incredible. I mean, that's such an incredible business that you've built and sustained for so long. I mean, it's rare to see it. And 
obviously a testament to your skills. So that's amazing. But now we were talking about how you're starting a second part to this business, which is more digital. So why don't you let us know like what that is and why you felt the need to kind of start this other part where you're clearly very successful at the first part? Yeah, I mean, this is like where I, I just feel so lit up by this other side. And it's a world that if your audience doesn't really know about, and I know you do because we chatted a little bit about this, but the opportunity online right now is so incredible. Even for as a consumer of content, you can really get high level world class training on really any topic that you want to know about. And there's all tiers of access. So you could learn for free and Google search the things you want to learn about and find YouTube videos or find people putting out free content all the way up to like $50,000 paid masterminds where you're getting really exclusive access to, you know, thought leaders and whatever you're looking to learn about. So I've been really deeply invested in just learning in depth about topics that interest me. And so several years back, I started to think about leveraging my expertise. And I was getting asked a lot of the same questions over and over again, which I loved sharing about. And particularly, I got asked to mentor people. And I was working with women all over the world, which is so, so cool. Like I had women in Australia and Africa and the UK and Scotland that I was mentoring. And I always said yes, whenever anyone reached out, because the kind of business that I built, and then, you know, now I'm a mom, my kids are seven and nine. But being able to be a fully present parent and run a business that brought in great income, and essentially working part time, working from home, working on my terms, that was as close to like, quote, having it all as I could envision for myself. And I wanted to teach other people how to have a business like that, because I felt like it was such a great gift in my life. So I always said, yes, yeah, I'd love to mentor you. And then one month last year, really early in the year, I had like five people ask me at once. And like, how cool is that? You know, and it just was like, I paid attention to the bigger message in that. Like, this is how I meant to serve. This is what people want to know from me. And what if I put some structure around it? And I got them all together also. So they had not just me, but a community around this. So they didn't have to feel like they were operating in a vacuum and trying to figure it all out. So I actually pre-sold my agency accelerator program. It's a coaching program. And it's also like a complete resource of step-by-step content and processes for how to launch, grow and scale a profitable agency. And I had six women enroll before I even put one single thing, you know, down on paper. I mean, I told them all that this isn't created yet. But if there's interest, I'll do it. And I'd love to have you in it. And they were like, Yes, yes, where do we sign up? And we'll wait as long as it takes like so that was pretty obvious. And truthfully, before that, I created a PR program because I really wanted to have, you know, like leveraged income and take my know how and serve and I launched that I put a lot of time and effort into it, really learned the online marketing world through the process of creating that program. But I was trying to serve too many people. I really went broad. And I said, I can help brands with physical products. And I can help experts who want to use the media to establish their expertise. And I was trying to serve everyone. And in turn, you end up serving nobody. (laughs) So, And that just wasn't what people wanted to know from me. And this other thing just happened so organically. And, you know, I get asked about it all the time. And It created a free community around it so that people can connect. And if they want to go kind of deeper with their training, there's an opportunity to do that with me. So it just felt like a way that I could give back and serve and offer people a complete roadmap for creating a profitable business that didn't run them to the ground, that didn't make them feel completely exhausted and wound down and really gave them the permission to kind of step into their expertise, permission to charge what they're worth and not price their services based around fear. And, you know, a lot of people also have these really limiting beliefs and mindset. And we work on a lot of that. It's actually quite a bit of what the program is about. And yeah, now I just love it so much. And that's awesome. Like the first six months that you launched this, you have already made over six figures with this program, right? Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. That is incredible. And I think there's so many things that I want to touch on and I don't want to take up too much of your time. But one of the things that you just said, and I really want to 
parlay to people that listen to this is that like you were just saying, there's so many courses. And I think a lot of times people that are in traditional fields, and we were just talking about like how we kind of roll our eyes at woo woo. We also, I think are very skeptical of like coaching and these programs and oh, it's like snake oil salesmen. And yeah, there's some that may not offer as much value in the online world. And I see anybody that's really successful is also like themselves taking so many coaching programs and and so much, so many courses. And it's like, you can now learn. It's not the old traditional way of learning. You can learn something, download what somebody has spent like 14 years learning and they've created a program and you can learn in a couple of weeks, like all the high points and kind of get yourself going. And so there's so much value that I want people to see, like you can get expertise in something and be a couple steps ahead of someone else and start offering those services by just learning online. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, truly. And you hit the nail on the head. It's almost like, you know, my mentor says it's like Neo in the matrix. You can just download yeah. <laughs> like somebody's whole life experience and most of the better coaches online are really positioning their online, you know, offerings as programs and not courses because they say now that it kind of approaches everyone's course the F out, right? right. Like, you know, and so mine is not necessarily a, a, a course. It's community, it's coaching and mentorship, accountability. And there is a quote unquote course, but it's more like, a library of resources. So wherever you are in your business, you can go straight to that content and say, okay, well, I have this big pitch. I have to have a sales call. Let me go to that piece of content and review how to get the most out of a sales call, how to position myself as the authority. It's like that library of content, you buy into it. And when I add to it, there's um, lifetime access to all of this stuff. And, you know, even if you just get two or three or four little gems from some program online that gives you a fast track to better results and better outcomes, more revenue, building a bigger audience, finding more joy in your in your business, like even just one little tidbit, it makes that investment worthwhile. And, you know, I've purchased a lot of courses that I just haven't really jumped into, but I found a community and a mentor that really resonates with me. And I have been so kind of deeply invested with my time and my, you know, it's a financial investment as well. But I've gotten so much out of it. And after 14 years of running my business from home on my own, you know, kind of feeling like I've been doing it in isolation, I now feel like I've found my people like these are my people, right? And they get what I'm going through. And a lot of them are parents and they're all just looking to have an impact and they're looking to serve. And that's what I want to do also. And they always remind us that when you have an impact, you will have an income, <laughs> you know? So, oh, yeah, that's a great way of looking yeah. at it. Yeah. Yeah. So and I think that what you were just saying, though, too, is a lot of this stuff. I mean, I think anybody that's stuck in this fear or doesn't know what they want to do, a huge thing, like with anything, when you work out, like accountability is key. That's why they say, like, get a partner to work out with because they'll keep you on track. And a right. lot of this stuff is just the community. It could be so lonely. And that roller coaster is so extreme where, like, you literally think you have the best idea. And then that same day, you're like, I'm an idiot. Why did I leave my career? Like, and, and it's just nice to have other people that understand that, that can help you kind of bounce back from the bad days because it'll keep you going and it, it'll keep you out of that isolation. So I love that you were mentioning that part in addition to just the actual knowledge that you gain, but it is really important to find the people that you resonate with and not do this alone because it can be very overwhelming. I love like obviously everything that you're saying and everything that you're doing. And I think that the other part of your digital course that I really wanted to highlight on is that what I've been trying to show with other guests as well is so many people really do have, even in their current business, that they don't like the current career that they're in, they might have a specialized knowledge. And right now there's just so much opportunity to teach this stuff or to coach people or to put this stuff out online or to do it in a, you know, very unique way and the kind of thinking about it outside of the box and creating a digital course or creating something that you can kind of create your own tribe and your community. And you, like you were saying, if you have an impact, you will have an income from it and you can end up making, I've seen so many people that are doing this where it's like they are taking their expertise and they're making that into a new career through a digital course or a, a program. Yeah. And I think that we often take for granted what we know how to do. 
And you kind of think, well, that's so easy. Like everybody knows that. And the reality is they don't know that. And you can take your know-how and turn it into a step-by-step process or some kind of proven system for how to get the same results. You know, I kind of take for granted, well, everybody knows where to find clients and everybody knows how to have successful sales calls. And this is all second nature. And I love it. And, you know, then I talk to my students and they're just like, oh my God, you know, even the free stuff that I put out, I'm like, oh, you know, maybe they're not going to think this is worth their time. And I feel like they're going to say, why did I sign up for this? And I just get such great feedback, like, oh my God, this has had such a major transformation and shift in my mindset and my business. And I, it's all really clear to me now, uh, realizing that if you know how to do something, you might feel like others know how to do it too, but they don't and they can learn from you. And a lot of times, to be really honest, they may already know what you know, but in hearing it from you, they are confirming their expertise or their know-how or that they're doing it right. And that has a huge impact on them too, because now they have the confidence. So they may already have the steps, but you know, I hear from a lot of my students, they're like, Oh yeah, you know, that's how I'm doing it. But I'm so glad to hear it from you because now I know that that's the right thing. So don't kind of take for granted. I mean, you think about all these people online that are doing makeup tutorials and there's a million of them, but they're doing them in their own way. And you know, I'm pretty decent at applying makeup, but I will watch a makeup right. tutorial until the cows come home because I'm like, what else can I learn? Or that's so fascinating. And, you know, it's just trying to think about what you know how to do. And the other thing is, what do people come to you and ask you for? Really listening to that thing you're known for. I mean, if you're great at organizing pantries or whatever it is, like there's a huge market for people coaching others on how to get their homes and their lives and their papers and their closets organized. I mean, just look at Marie Kondo. If you think about that whole movement, it's really just get rid of things that don't make you happy. Right. And like hold everything else and stick it in. A, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. but that's a multi-million dollar Absolutely. business. Everyone's glued to it. And it's like, what is the thing you know how to do? What do people come to you for? And then you put your own unique spin on it and make it your own. Yes, I love that. I mean, I think that's been a major theme and I really want to hammer in the fact that it, this isn't back in the day. You can literally make an income doing anything. And we've highlighted some other stories. Tyler McCall was here and he talked yeah. about somebody selling salad dressing recipes and a PDF and making tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, uh. there's just so many opportunities. You just have to like think outside the box and think about what you're good at and what you love and focus on that. So I love everything you just said. Tyler's in, um, in my mask. Mastermind. Oh, I love yeah, that. I just spent a week with him in, in Laguna and I actually was just watching his master class because he opened his Instagram program yeah. and I was just kind of watching how he was doing it. And, you know, he's teaching Instagram, right? And there's a million people teaching Instagram, but he has just stepped into his personality and just being himself. And that has been such a shift. He doesn't have to hide behind, he says, you know, a perfectly curated grid. He is now just showing up and loving on his people and serving them in a way that comes from a place of genuineness and just being who he already is. Yeah, absolutely. And that has skyrocketed his bit. You know, he's making $50,000 a month. It's crazy. Online. So yeah, I mean, and, and he's working from home and he's working part time. So that's the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that you said that. Thank you so much. Jen, this has been incredible. If people want to reach out to you or find you, find your program, where is the best place for them to look? Um, well, I'm all over social media at Generation PR spelled with a J. And my website is generationpr.com. And there's actually nothing online about this program. It's super under the radar, but there is going to be a challenge that people can opt into. It's actually generationpr.com com slash five day challenge. And I'm going to be walking through how to get five client leads in five days. That's kind of my upcoming kind of free offering. So yeah. Great. I will link to all that in the show notes. This has been so inspiring. Thank you so much for joining us, Jen. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for chatting. I could talk to Jen forever. She's amazing. I loved that episode. And here are three quick takeaways. One, take action. I mean, 
she just reached out to someone while she was a lawyer and offered to help to get them into magazines when she didn't know what she was doing, but she just felt pulled to that. I see that in so many interviews where people are just doing things for free on the side, on the nights, on weekends, of things that they like, and that leads them into their career path. So just start doing it, you know, like get yourself in there and whatever it is that you like and see where it takes you. Two, I know it sounds cliche, but things are cliche for a reason. We say them so much that they become cliche. You only have this one life. I admire the fact that she could realize that at 27. And a lot of us, a lot of times we're living for other people and to not upset them and do not make waves. And you only get this one shot. So figure out what it is you want to be doing and start doing more of that. And third, I would say for me, when I look at these kind of stories, it's easy to talk about like numbers and how much she's making and oh, how cool is like how big her PR agency is. But I just, I mean, I look back at these interviews and I think like, what a cool experience she's had, you know, by deciding to take this jump, she has built something like she got to be in these rooms with these multi-billion dollar companies and come up with their marketing campaign and how they're going to get into all these magazines. And she got to be a part of that creative process. And now she's building up her own agency where she gets to help people build up businesses and do the things that lights them up. And that's such a cool experience and legacy. And I just think a lot of times we worry so much about what we could lose that we don't think about what we're giving up by not taking these jumps. So I hope that helps. And I will see you on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. I can't tell you how much it means to me. If you liked the podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. It'll help other people find the show. If you want to connect or reach out, follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Lessons from a Quitter and on Twitter at Quitter Podcast. I would love to hear from you guys and I'll see you on the next episode.